how we help other people that we know to find hope in Jesus. So I want to ask you, I'm going to begin by asking this, how many of you have found hope in Jesus and in his resurrection? Would you raise your hand? You know, amen. That gets me excited to see the way that we are a group of people as God's people in the church. We've experienced the love and the grace and the hope that comes in Jesus and in his resurrection. That just gets me excited to, to see even that silent witness. Yes, I'm one of those people. I found hope in Jesus. And last week we talked about uh, the story that comes right before the one we're going to look at today. The one of two disciples, Cleopas and one other guy. And they leave and they walk that dark road to Emmaus. And they don't recognize Jesus as he comes and walks the seven miles to Emmaus. Um, and it's not until they get to the home where they're going and they sit down around a table and Jesus takes bread and he breaks it and gives it to them that he's made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And they realize that it's Jesus who's been walking along with them this whole time. And that's really where I want to pick up the story today. As, as Luke was reading to us, they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and while he was opening the scriptures to us? So when he vanishes from their sight, they realize that everything has changed. He really is alive. And their hearts begin to burn within them. And that's what happens when we encounter the risen Lord. Jesus helps us to find hope and helps us to begin to understand more clearly the scriptures. God's plan for salvation for each of us and for the world. And that's why we want so badly for people who are associated with our church in any way, or members, not members, but to come and to connect to God in worship. And it's why we really believe that when, also when you connect to others in a small group, whether that's a Sunday school class or a Bible study, that you begin to, to study God's Word together with other Christians. And you realize, I don't have all the answers. And other people that come, they realize, I don't have all the answers either. either but I've learned some things. I've experienced this about God. And we're able to help each other to grow and to understand the Bible more clearly and to see how it applies to our lives. And when you're going through a dark time, there's a group of people in that small group and they come and they put their arms around you and they help to carry you through that time. And you do that for people when you see that happening to them as well. And this is the way Jesus helps us to grow as disciples and to find hope for the blessed future that God has for each one of us. John Wesley had an experience once and he writes about it in his journal. I love what he says. He said, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans about a quarter before nine while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he'd taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I want to share with you that this wasn't the moment when John Wesley confessed his faith in Christ and received salvation, but it was one of those moments along the journey where he felt the assurance of God coming, and the story becomes personal. Yeah, he knew Jesus died for everyone, but everyone includes me. He died for me too. And, and Wesley experiences that in that moment. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you. That's what we sing. Jesus loves me. Yes, this I love. For the Bible tells me so. But His love is for you. Even you. And for the person next to you. And for people who aren't here today. His love is so big. And Jesus' love is the only thing that can ever fill that God-shaped hole that each of us has in our hearts. It's that very love that God has for us that really inspired those two disciples to get up that day on that first Easter Sunday. And Luke tells us that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. So when they experienced the risen Christ, what was their response? It was this. We've got to tell the others. We've got good news. You know, it had taken them two hours to march down that seven miles, sadly. But now I can only imagine that they're kind of half jogging all seven miles back. They probably made it in an hour to go and share the good news. And, and that's the thing, you know, when you have good news to share, you, you can't keep it to yourself, can you? You know, when you have good news to share, oh my goodness, you've got to tell others. When my daughters are almost four and six years old, and I remember when each of them were born, 
Allison and I, we had our cell phones and we were taking pictures and we were texting friends and calling them and telling them how big each of the girls was and how much they weighed. And Allison posted it on Facebook. You know, it was good news. We, we had to share it with others. And that's the thing about good news is that you just have to share good news. And when you experience the love of God in this way, you want to share God's love with the other people in your life. So let me ask you this. With whom do you share your good news? Who are the people close to you that you go and tell the good things, the good blessings that happen in your life? You know, you share with people you know. You share with your family and your friends. You share maybe with your classmates or your co-workers. You share with your neighbors. And you share with anyone with whom that you have care for. And these two disciples cared about the eleven who are still huddled back in the upper room, still thinking that Jesus died, still confused by the reports of His resurrection. They had to go back because they loved those disciples. They were their friends too. And they had to go back and share the good news and tell them, we've seen Him. He's alive. He's alive. It changes everything. Now, they were excited. But I'll tell you, even when you're excited, it doesn't mean everyone else is always going to be excited. Some people aren't ready to hear the good news. And you find this really in all of the Gospels, the doubts that, that people went through experiencing the resurrection the first time. Mark's Gospel tells us very briefly, after this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. And the doubts that people experience, even on that first Easter Sunday, you know, almost no one could really get their minds around someone dying, being in a tomb for three days, and rising again. And so, you know, in John's Gospel, all of the blame for doubting is put on poor Thomas. And I love Thomas. He needs a gung ho disciple. It's always like, you've got to take up for it. You know, uh, uh, he wasn't there, and he doubts that Jesus really is alive. But a week later, Jesus came and stood among them again. And, and said, peace be with you. And he showed Peter the, the marks in his hands and gave Peter a chance to believe in a little doubting Peter. I mean, sorry, Thomas. Doubting Thomas doesn't stay doubting Thomas. You know, he falls down on his knees and says, my Lord and my God. And he believes in Jesus and in his resurrection. And, you know, I think sometimes sharing the good news is kind of like telling someone, kind of preparing them to meet someone um, before they've met that person. And that's what these disciples go into. Verse 34, they were saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and He has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how He had made, been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as Madison was sharing with us, when Jesus was born, one of the names given Him was Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And He was God with us when He was little baby Jesus, right? At Christmas. But now, even after His death, and His resurrection. He's living up to that name, Emmanuel, God with us. And verse 36, the story continues. While they were talking about this, Jesus Himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. And He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at My hands and My feet. See that it is I Myself. Touch Me and see Me. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them the nail prints in his hands and in his feet. The wounds are still there. They're not bleeding still. They're beginning to heal, healed over, but, but they're still there. And he's saying, look at my hands and feet where I was nailed to the cross. Yeah, that's right. I did die. You're not seeing a ghost, though. I'm alive again. I have been resurrected. And I like how he describes their response. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. They're joyful, but they can't quite believe it. They can't quite grasp it. Have you ever experienced something that just seemed too good to be true? You're just kind of waiting for the carpet to be pulled, you know, out from under you. They wanted to believe what they were seeing, but they're still like, is it, is it really Jesus? Could it really be Him? And they're afraid of maybe getting it wrong, but, but Jesus helps them to experience the resurrection so that they can believe. Verse 41, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He's proving them, I'm not a ghost. I'm real. I'm here. I'm physically real here with you. And Jesus is telling them, It's me. I, I know you don't understand. I know it's hard to believe and hard to grasp. 
But go ahead. Look what God has done through me and through my resurrection. And that's what Jesus always does. And I'll just tell you this. You or I, we can't make someone believe in Jesus. But we can love them. We can pray for them. We can tell them about what Jesus has done in our lives. And we can trust that just as the risen Lord comes to us, whether it's when we gather around the Lord's table or when we're singing and having fellowship together, when we come to worship and we experience the presence of the risen Lord, we can trust that the risen Lord, just as He went to those early disciples, just as He's come to us, He'll find a way to make Himself known to your friend or your family member or the person that you know that doesn't quite know Jesus' love just yet. Jesus began to explain the scriptures to them. We get to verse 44. It's a lot like the, the, the time when those two disciples were walking on the road to me. It's very similar. Verse 44, then he said to them, These are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And so once again, he begins to remind them of all the things that he's taught them. He's reminding them of the, the miracles and the healings that they've seen him perform to minister to people. He's reminding them of all the stories he told, all the ways that he taught them about the kingdom of God and about God's love in our world and in our lives. And it finally begins to make sense. The rejection, the suffering, the crucifixion, they weren't a detour from God's plan at all. They were the final steps of God's long journey through life, death, and back to life. And the disciples have witnesses. They've been witnesses all along, but they're witnesses to these final steps of his resurrection. Jesus was not a ghost. He was their resurrected Lord. God had won. God had defeated sin and death. And then he said to them, Thus it's written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Then he looked them all in the eyes and he said, you are witnesses of these things. And see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you've been clothed from power on high. That's what the resurrection is all about. Jesus came to call people to repentance and forgiveness of sins, that they might experience the love and the grace and the salvation of God. And Jesus is telling them, you are my witnesses. You've seen everything that I've done. You've walked with me. You've seen me heal people and cast out demons. You've seen me welcome people who felt rejected. You've heard my teaching, teachings, and most importantly, you've known me. You have got to know me in my, my heart. And you've been present to witness to my life and my death and my resurrection. And you've watched all of the scriptures about me be fulfilled. And so now I'm going to send you to go and tell others what you've seen, what God is doing in our world. And he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to empower you so that you can go out and empower and encourage. And the Holy Spirit's going to come on the day of Pentecost and take this little band of scared people who are worried about being hunted down and killed just as Jesus was and send them out to be witnesses in such a way that they no longer even fear death. And that most of them would be put to death by, you know, means of crucifixion and other um, capital punishment. And yet, their witness stood forth because of not only the words they spoke, but the way that they lived and the way that they died and the confidence they had that they too would be raised from the dead, resurrected, to be with their Lord, to be with each other on the day of resurrection. Now I ask you, you know, what does a witness do? You know, do you have to be an expert witness? You can. You can be someone who's an expert on someone. They call you to the stand and you tell them, you know, about your expertise on something. But to be a witness, you just have to be someone who saw what happened, who experienced it. You may not even be an expert on it. You may not feel like, oh, I'm no theologian. I couldn't tell someone about God. But if you've experienced God's love, if you've experienced God's grace, if Jesus has brought healing in any way into your life, you can be a witness. You can be someone who goes out and tells other, you know, what Jesus has done. Those first witnesses, I touched him. He wasn't a ghost. I saw the marks in his hands. He really was the crucified one and he rose again. 
We broke bread with him. He ate fish with us. And even 2,000 years later, their story has become our story. You know, being a witness, it's not really a ministry or program that we put on at the church once a week. It's a lifestyle. It's the way that you live. And it's the way that we offer hope to people. You know, and we share with them what Jesus' life and death and resurrection means for us. You know, today our offer mans are going to come forward and they're going to join the church. And they're going to make vows, um, promises about how they're going to participate in the church. Through their prayers, being people who pray for themselves and for each other. Their presence, coming and being in worship in Sunday school each week, being part of the church every week. They're working towards being generous disciples. You know, some of them have an allowance and they have money for birthdays and, and what does it mean for me to, to begin giving generously a tithe of what God's given me? When I have a little, I'm going to start giving generously so that when I have a lot, that'll be a, a lifestyle for me. And then service, you know, each of our coffee bands, even today, has come forward to help serve by leading us in worship. And then also to be a witness, to share your faith, to go out and invite people to church, all those kinds of things. But it may start with inviting someone to church, and that may be where you start, it may not. But it's really about, you know, um, sharing your life through relationships. Not getting on a street corner and yelling at someone about how God's going to get them. I, I tell you, that doesn't work. It doesn't work on me, probably doesn't work on you either. But when you just embrace a friendship, and you're able to share what God's done in your life in a way that's appropriate in that relationship, God can do something with that. Now, you know, they're going to make those vows today. I know many of you are members of this church already. And I wonder if you wouldn't be willing to stand today as members of the church. Because I want our offer to be able to turn around and look and see the body of people that they're joining today. Would, would you be so gracious as to stand if you're a member of the church just for a moment? And Meg, Gracie, and Jack, look, turn around and look. This is the people that you're joining in serving Christ. Y'all can be seated. Thank you so much. But being Christians is something that we do as the church together. We help each other. We encourage each other. We serve together. And I just want to say one more, a couple more things just very briefly about being a witness and the way we live that life out. Did you know that 75 to 90 percent of people who begin attending a church do so because a friend or relative invited them to come to church with them? Isn't that amazing? Most of us who are here are here because someone who loved us and cared about us invited us to come. Uh, if you were a child, your parent brought you, maybe you were forced to come, but still, you came anyway. And did you know that 35% of unchurched people would come to church if a friend invited them? Now, here's the bad news. That means that two-thirds of people wouldn't come if you invited them, but one-third would. And, and they might not even come the first time you invite them. But if you invite them, if you invite them to come to the marathon, I know it's hard to get here that day. But that's going to be a party. That's going to be a pretty cool day, right? You know, to come to a church a day like today, like today, we have people joining the confirmands. It's a joyous day in the life of the church. And maybe you don't even start with worship. Maybe you invite them to one of those Kiva parties or one of those parties the group puts on or something. You know, and we're like, hey, we may be crazy Christians, but we know how to have fun. Why don't you come and have fun with us? You know? Uh, but when you invite someone to come and experience the love of the people of God, aren't we a pretty loving group of people? I like to think so. You know, we reach out, we meet people, and someone who was a stranger, they become a friend very quickly in our church, don't they? So I want you to begin thinking about someone you know. It could be someone in this church that you haven't even seen in a while, you know, and, and you know they're still part of the church, but they just haven't been here. And you love them and care about them, so, you know, you might just pull out your little sermon card today, and you might just write, here's one, write their name just somewhere on it. This is a little reminder to you, and you begin praying for that person or for that family. And maybe this week, you find a time just to reach out to them, to give them a call or send them a little note and say, I was thinking about you. How have you been doing? You know, maybe invite them to come on the marathon day because it's going to be a fun day. Um, it could be someone that doesn't have a church home. But you know that they would benefit from the love of the people of God in this church. And, and maybe invite them to come and sit with you or come to something fun that we're doing. And you know, next week, it really could be someone that you invite as someone who's lost a loved one here in the last year. Because we're going to talk about how we find hope and resurrection when someone we love dies. What's our hope? What does that mean for that person who's passed on? Will we see them again? And we believe, yes, we will. And so that might be the most 
caring thing you could do for that person is to invite them to come and find the hope that we have in the resurrection, that this life on earth is not all there is to it. So I just want to invite you to be thinking in those kind of ways because we're a group of loving people in this church. We care about each other. We care about people who are not yet part of this church. And we care about people in other churches too, you know. But that's the kind of love God calls us to. So I just want to say to each of our confirmands, we're so happy that, that you have taken upon yourself to, to grow and learn. And then when we were doing our interviews, Pastor Matt and I with the each of the confirmands, one of the things we asked them is today going to be a graduation or a beginning? And we all recognize that yeah, it's the end of confirmation and we celebrate that. But we focus more on the fact that today is a beginning for them as they join the life of the church and say, I want to follow Jesus and be part of this church and his ministry for the rest of my life. And those are the vows that each of us who remember this church have taken. It's why we show up and it's why we serve and it's why we give. Because we love Jesus and we want to be part of what he's doing in the world. And so I invite you today to be witnesses in the ways that God shows you how you can be a witness to the people in your life. And trust that God is going to do good things. Jesus is going to show up and the Holy Spirit is going to empower you to make a Christian difference in your life and in the world. Do you want to be witnesses? Say amen. amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for those first witnesses who found hope in Jesus. And we thank you that he came to them to show them that he really was alive. To help them to overcome their doubts and to believe. And to receive healing where they needed healing, but then also to be sent back out, filled by the Holy Spirit, to go and share your good news with a hurting world. And we know that you still show up today, Jesus. You're with us even now. And we love you and we worship you. And we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. And once again, send us out to share your love and to offer hope and good news to people who need some hope and some good news. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and turn to your bulletin. You'll find the words to the songs we're going to sing.